Why, ladies and gentlemen, on today's show, we are recapping a Marlins series that featured a lot of good pitching, a lot of bad Padres offense, and, and a Jorge how far away, baby. Let's get into it, guys. You know what you're listening to. Kapow! You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today for Monday, May 9th. As always, I am your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You can find me on Twitter at Javapeno, which is spelled G-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres. And please check out the old YouTube guys, Locked on Padres on YouTube, free and available on all platforms. Thank you for making us your first listen. And today's show, let me tell you, let me tell you, we have a treat because the Padres even though it isn't always pretty, right? It's not always the most decisive, you know, LA Dodgers or didn't the Giants just beat someone by like nine runs or whatever, or the New York Mets, like those best teams. But the Padres are finding ways to win baseball games, winning three out of four against the Miami Marlins. Going to be talking about each game in the series. Just some of my thoughts over the, over the four game stretch. If you guys want to hear a uh, a little bit more of a Marlins perspective, I talked with Peter Pratt on Friday's episode, which you guys can go listen to, watch, or whatever, uh, where we kind of previewed the series. And it's funny because we're going to talk about that first, this uh, the recent game, which happened yesterday. Uh, we're going to be talking about that. It's funny, on the podcast, I had mentioned, you know, I, I brought it up I, as a joke. I did not predict it. I can't take predicting it and whatnot, but I did kind of allude to um, the idea of a revenge game for Jorge Alfaro. And such a thing happened, and I alluded to it did feel like that this series was going to have a something, right? It was going to have something. And boy, did we get it, guys. Let's talk about Sunday's game really quickly. The Padres ended up winning 3-2 to two, thanks to a three-run walk-off home run in the bottom of Jorge Alfaro, allowing both Trent Grisham and C.J. Abrams to score. An absolute bomb delivered by, let's see, what's his name? Is it Was it Bass? Who's that Marlins reliever? Sulcer. That's right. Cole Sulcer, who up until that point, by the way, uh, had a 0.77 ERA. That should be brought up. And what's funny is a uh, big longtime friend of the podcast, Arm Lane, he's a big Marlins fan. We text all the time. And he had texted. I write for a website called Just Baseball, which I've plugged many times on this um, podcast. And I, put, I tweeted this out that he joked, like, I'm going to fold the company if Jorge Alfaro hits a home run. For those who don't know, Jorge Alfaro, former Marlin, pretty bad with the Marlins, and honestly hasn't been so great with the Padres. Um, kind of like a, a guy who just seems to have a lot of tools, seems to have a lot of athleticism and raw power, but it's never quite translated, right? And it's funny that he ends up saying that right before the home run happens, and he leaves the chat. It was hilarious. We're all roasting him and dosting him and all this stuff. And uh, by the way, also for my YouTube listeners, apologies if the lighting is a little bit weird right now. I'm trying to fix the... You see how those lights are a little bit odd or whatever. Hold on. I can't even do my fingers properly. This is really hard. Oh, oh. okay. Anyway, um, so apologies for that. But with Alfaro, hasn't been a very productive player for the Padres. He's a backup catcher, which is okay. Like, it's that's not the worst thing that you could do with Alfaro. You could have a lot worse at backup catcher, at least I think, right? I get it. And it's funny that Solcer, on top of having that 0.77 ERA, and I believe on the year had kind of been their saves guy, um, basically the last... What is it? One, two, three, four, five, five opportunities he had. He converted on his state good for them so far. And he was actually pretty decent for Baltimore last year as well. In a 60 game sample size, he had a decent strikeout stuff, all this stuff, right? Nothing crazy, but bottom line is he'd been effective in terms of just minimizing runs. And he just throws, not even a meatball, but this just, this cement mixer. I forgot what the term is for this pitch, but the number one type of pitch that Jorge Alfaro, if I'm not mistaken, still leads the league in outside swing zone percentage, which is just a, basically like he chases too much, always outside the zone, and he does not make enough contact, which is why he's not very productive of a player. That was a questionable pitch decision by the Marns there, and he takes it for like 450 feet. Don Orsillo loses his mind. You probably, If you haven't heard him lose it, then, man, you're missing out. It was great. And there you go. 
the Padres win. And it's really great to win, not just on Mother's Day and in this fashion. Uh, and by the way, uh, Manny Machado confirmed in post-game stuff that they brought back the swag chain uh, and that they were saving it for the right moment. What moment is better than this? Alfaro's big hit against his former team. Didn't call it. I wish I could say I called it, but nonetheless, it was an awesome moment. I needed that. Not that the Padres had been on a giant losing streak. All right. They hadn't actually. They won three out of four against the Marlins, despite only scoring eight runs in these four games, by the way. They still managed to win uh, three out of the four games. We're going to talk a little bit about the offense over the course of the episode. But, uh, man, I mean, it was just fun. I, I don't have a lot of analysis for you guys other than that. It's just that's what we're doing out here. We're celebrating. That was super fun. And it was in the bottom of the ninth. The Padres hadn't scored any runs to that point. The only runs scored beforehand were, if I'm not mistaken, off of Joe Musgrove, uh, a sacrifice fly from Garrett Cooper, who's one of the uh, Marlins' uh, better hitters, and then Jazz Chisholm, who, if you guys haven't seen, I retweeted on my account, but go check out Arm Layton's. Uh, I've plugged him a lot on this podcast. Go check out his article on Jazz Chisholm, breaking down in, in really good detail, by the way, in terms of like breakdowns of zones, not just like, oh, he's batting 320. Not that that's you know, that that has a big deal with it, but really breaking down why Jazz is becoming a superstar on top of just being lit as hell. I mean, he's just a funnest, you know what player to watch. Um, but in this game, uh, in terms of just break down the pitching really quickly, Trevor Rogers, no earned runs, only allows five hits, two walks and three Ks. He looked OK. He's been one of the Marlins weaker starters this year. Uh, he might just be having a sophomore slump. He was great last year. His four-seam fastball was among the best four-seam fastballs. I think it was four-seam fastball in the entire league. He was a National League Rookie of the Year runner-up next to Jonathan India over in the Cincinnati Reds organization. But he didn't look all that incredible. Um, unfortunately, the Padres' first baseman, I'm not hating on him, wasn't able to convert some potential RBI opportunities early in the game. Um, but Hey, it happens. It happens. The Padres offense needs to kick it in gear. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then for the Padres, Mr. Consistency, right? It seems like we're getting almost the same stat line each time. And that's because he leads the majors with quality starts. He's gotten six or more innings in each of his starts to start the year. That is, of course, Cotton Eye Joe, Joe Musgrove, going seven innings, allowing two earned runs on five hits, one walk, eight Ks. Uh, aside from one outing, he's managed six strikeouts or more. His ERA is at 2.08. He gives up the big hits sometimes. He does. Not in terms of, he'll give up like the big nuke home run maybe, but he doesn't offer consistent line drives and all that stuff. His whiff stuff is still awesome. Among one of the five best pitches, I mean, his slider is just vicious. He can kill you with the curveball, as we all know. Um, I mean, he's great. He's great. I have no doubt in my mind that Joe Musgrove is going to maintain a level of this for the rest of the year. Maybe not a, a, a sub two ERA or anything like that, but he's going to be fantastic. I trust him implicitly. And I imagine you listen to the podcast. You probably do too. I don't think I'm converting any non-believers. Musgrove is awesome. So it's good to see that his good pitching didn't go totally to waste uh, that we won a game that he pitched, not because we had the lead when he left the game and whatnot, but it's still nice on mother's day for all that. Uh, just, just awesome, man. Three out of four against the Marlins. And the Marlins, by the way, I know what people might be saying. They just got swept by the D-backs. But that team isn't that bad. Um, they're not as bad as they were last year. And Jazz is becoming a star. Garrett Cooper's pretty good. Joey Wendell. And their rotation is on the level of the Padres. If I Honestly, I know this might sound crazy. But on the level of the Padres rotation, for sure. And you might even be able to argue better once they get some of their prospects get called up. But uh, definitely a nice test case litmus test for the Padres to play somebody a little bit better than the Cincinnati Reds. But guys, before we talk about, all right, the rest of the games that occurred this weekend, and unfortunately there wasn't, it wasn't all great and whatnot, guys, but let me talk to you about betting. All right, guys, betonline.net. It is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball, and this weekend's run to the roses as the Kentucky Kentucky Derby is back. I probably shouldn't have said that part. My apologies. The Kentucky Derby just happened. I saw there was a 1 in 80 shot that somebody won. Shouts to you. If you, if you checked out Bet Online's um uh, odds, you might have hey, you might have said, "Hey, I'll throw 20 bucks on this." You you made out big time if that happens. So be sure guys to check out Bet Online. They've got it on live betting, playoffs, esports and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online where the game starts. And again, guys, just want to reiterate, thank you for making Lockdown Padres your hashtag first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Let's talk about the rest of the week. 
All right, let's start with actually, let's start with, I want to, mm, I don't know, actually, because I started with yesterday's game first. Let's start with another win. How about that? Because it's another win that, again, like I said, the Padres didn't score a lot of runs in the series, so there's not much to talk about from an offense perspective. But let's talk about the first game of the series. I know it's a little bit old. Let's just touch on that really quickly. In this game, uh, Jesus Lazardo went for the Marlins. Uh, six innings, two earned runs on three hits, three walks, seven Ks. Jesus Lazardo, low-key, and we talked about this on the chat with Peter Pratt, has been like... If you're going to trade a guy, even though they shouldn't have traded Starling Marte, because they do have a little bit of a center field outfield problem uh, with Avi Garcia and Jorge Soler not necessarily coming up too big for them. Um, that if you're going to, if you have to trade a guy for whatever reason, getting Jesus Lazardo back, even if you don't need pitching, that was a great get by them. They bought on Jesus Lazardo, who just had a really bad kind of stretch with Oakland. And they said, you know what? Screw it. This kid's young and he's got a lot of potential. We're not going to let one season throw everybody off reminds me a little bit of actually a little bit of a Luis Severino situation where a guy kind of came in as a top level prospect and just immediately floundered. And then everyone kind of forgot about him. And then what happened? Severino in his second season with the Yankees was awesome. And then of course, Lazardo has been awesome and he looked great by the way. The only reason they gave up runs is because the current leader, I think I don't, he's at least in the top three current leader, and wins above replacements, according to Fangraphs. Manny Machado, a two-home run game for him. Two solo shots to deep center and then left center. He, I mean, he's a madman. I mean, he's a madman. He's been so unbelievable to start this season. You guys have been watching him. Just for a reminder on what he's batting right now. Let's see here. He's batting 381 with a 459 on base and 648 slugging. Also to go along with six steals. If I'm not mistaken, he's got more stolen bases than like Trey Turner. By the way. I'm the idiot that drafted Trey Turner in my fantasy league. Should I have done that? No, I choked. This is what happens sometimes in snake drafts. I get really nervous, and then whoever's ranked at the top, I'm like, well, ESPN must have an idea what they're doing, and I pick Trey Turner. So everybody kill me. Uh, I should have taken Trap. That's what I should have done, and I, I panicked. I panicked. It happens sometimes. But nevertheless, guys, Machado aiming for that MVP uh, trophy for the end of the season. The only other thing we're talking about in this game, probably from what I remember and what I see here is that Trent Grisham ended up actually batting a little bit lower in the lineup. He went hitless in this one with a strikeout telling you guys for a while. Um, and granted, I think it was a vocal minority in my mentions last week, but Grisham's becoming a problem. By the way, Eric Lauer, another great start for him. All right. And by the way, let me also actually, let me save it for the end of the podcast. Let's just quickly mention Nick Martinez in this game. Seven innings, which was huge, by the way, given that the bullpen was pretty gassed. Seven innings, one earned run on four hits, one walk, four Ks. Changeup looks good. Uh, one of the highest whiff rates in pitches on the Padres roster. Uh, one of the best run values. He's been very, very solid for a number five back end rotation guy. This start against the Marlins has made the Gore versus Martinez potential decision fascinating. Fascinating. I really need to see what happens here. You would assume Mackenzie Gore built as a frontline starter. What if Martinez moved to the bullpen? Agreed, but in fairness, Nick Martinez, 3-3 ERA. I know he had a bad game against, who was it that he had a bad game against? He was a little bit bad against Atlanta. And he was a little bit rough against the Dodgers, but those are two good teams I just mentioned. This is a guy that I would have really loved to have on last year's team. They actually don't need um, necessarily this one as much. Uh, hold on one second. I just got to mention on Twitter. I'll look at that a little bit later. But um, my perspective on the situation is I actually am totally cool kind of within either outcome. I would understand if the Padres are like, you know what? Martinez is pretty good. Let's kind of roll with him. Let's let Gore work on some things. Yes, the fastball has been effective, but he's, you know, against better teams, not necessarily been as dominant. Maybe they say, you know what? Let's kind of let him work out the kinks on his changeup, which he hasn't thrown all that much. His other three plus pitches that he hasn't used as much as the fastball. I would understand that. I also think, hey, keep him up here. Keep him working with the major league staff. Keep him working with Ruben Niebla. Pitching guru over out of Cleveland that we acquired. One of the most low-key things. I've been saying it for a while. Low-key things. I'm kind of of the opinion that either decision would be kind of cool. I mean, Martinez is clearly better. And I do owe an apology to the man, uh, at least to a degree. I have been, I got, I kind of started to walk back my initial podcast a decent amount of time ago. I was basically like about a month before the season. My thing was kind of like, look, he can be okay as a back end starter that maybe we should give him some time. 
fastball velocity, a lot of stuff did go up in Japan. He did seem to get a little bit better. Like, right. So do I think he was going to fix everything? And were there other guys I wanted? I wanted Alex Cobb. I wanted Alex Wood. I even kind of wanted my Tyler Anderson and some of these other guys around the league. But in fairness, he was a fifth starter, right? He's a five guy. And I was like, you know what? Compare him to Arietta and Velasquez and even maybe a little bit of Paddock. Not too bad. And he's performed admirably well. I'm very curious to see, given that the Padres bullpen has struggled so much, would Martinez potentially be a guy for the bullpen? I don't know if he, we have to see. This is a very interesting uh, plot line that's going to be developing over the next couple a uh, week or so until Blake Snell comes back, right? Who had his his minor league uh, A ball start. I'm pretty sure. What was it on Thursday or Friday? I forgot when it was, but um, this is going to be a really interesting storyline. I can't wait to see how it transpires. Now let's talk about uh, what is it? Friday's game, guys. Uh, another positive, actually. I, f- I thought they lost the Friday game, but let's talk about pod- the Friday game really quickly. Oop. I'm going to burp. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Ah. That was probably music to my listeners' ears there, everybody. Um, my apologies. Seven innings for you, Darvish, on on Saturday's game. I'm sorry, Friday's game. I am a mess right now. Friday's game, going seven innings, allowing two earned runs on four, five hits, uh, walking zero, striking out three. 97 pitches, not bad. Didn't get a lot of total whiffs, as evidenced maybe by the strikeout and whatnot. But he was solid. I mean, 1.08 whip isn't too bad. 4.05 ERA. I'd like that to go down a little bit, but not too bad of a start for Mr. U Darvish. And, you know, someone who's who's in my mentions, I should probably talk about this now about the Grisham thing that they're saying, well, I'd rather have you Darvish or, uh, over Eric Lauer. And my thing is, in a vacuum, maybe that's a debate for sure. I think I'd stay, still take you Darvish, especially in a big game. I think he's capable. But my thing is, Eric Lauer is entering prime years. My thing is that Eric Lauer is not costing nearly as much in terms of money. And my other thing is that Eric Lauer is, if you don't trade for you Darvish and you maybe ride it with Eric Lauer a little bit, and he is molding into what he might be molding into with Milwaukee, you get to keep those other assets that they gave up for Darvish to maybe improve, uh, improve other areas of the team. Right. Someone else in my mentions uh, over the weekend was kind of like, Hey, uh, they gave up guys because they're like, look out Lauer might not have made this rotation, which is true this year's rotation. Maybe. Last year, he probably would have made a little bit of a shot, I'd say, especially with all the injuries and the struggles of certain guys. But, you know, and Urias, he was never going to start. That's a great point. That's one point I made as well, too. Influx of infielders, that part's not a problem. It's almost like I'm only looking at the Lauer part. Urias, it's fine. If you had an influx of infielders, including prospects like Abrams, and you have Tatis and Machado and Cronenworth blows up, right? Then I get and Profar and, you know, all these guys, right? That it makes sense for you to be like, no, it's okay. Hassan Kim, guys like that, right? That, that's okay, but the Lauer thing is a little scary in a vacuum, right? And kind of saying, Grisham, it makes sense they traded for him because they needed a center fielder. They needed outfield depth. They needed someone who could play a good defensive outfield. But Grisham's scaring me, man. And in this game, he actually – he walked twice, by the way, in this this Friday game. He went one for two with a triple, which was awesome, and two walks. So a good game from Trent Grisham on the season. Just for a reminder for you guys, though, 160, 282, 255 slash line with one home run, no stolen bases, 15 walks to 29 strikeouts. He's got a great ability to walk, but he's also striking out. Looking a little bit Joey gallo out there, except without the power. Uh, so that's really scary. I thought that this guy was... I remember I stupidly, egg on my face, said that he was a top 15, top 10 MVP candidate heading into the 2021 season. I thought his defense was going to be great, and then he hit 250 with like 28 home runs, 340, 350 on base. I thought he was going to be awesome, and I was wrong about that, and I think we're all starting to worry, right? Um, Just what it is. When you look at his, just watch him bat, and you get worried, right? But in fairness, in this game, he was solid. Hopefully, he can improve as time goes along, and hopefully, the rest of the Padres offense can improve. I know they end up winning this Friday game thanks to, yep, it's been a while. I haven't, I haven't said them on, on much on this podcast episode. Bottom of the first inning, an RBI double from the first baseman who must not be named, allowing Manny Machado to score. You got a double from Matt Beatty and a single from Manny Machado to kind of um, short things up. Jazz Chisholm, or I'm sorry, not Jazz Chisholm, Jesus Aguilar ends up hitting a boom shot to left field, by the way. Holy crap. Uh, that ends up making a 3-2 game. But thankfully, thankfully, uh, Steven Wilson, who started off awesome, by the way, he also, with some of his pitches, has had an incredible strikeout rate. I mean, if you look at it against the Giants, he went two innings, five Ks, no hits, no walks. And then right when I started talking about him, 
he gave up a bunch of runs and he almost blew this game, but earns his first career save. So shout out to Steven Wilson for that. Um, and not much else to really point out here, aside from the fact that Manny Machado and the Padres first baseman have been some of the best is one of the best tandems in all of baseball right now in terms of a duo uh, batting three and four uh, most games. It looks like, especially with Profar falling down more in the lineup. I mean, he's been awesome. So hopefully the top of that lineup with Cronenworth, who I genuinely do believe is going to get better. Uh, he gets two strikeouts in this game. I, I really do think that he's getting there. Hassan Kim, who is infinitely better as a bat. I mean, you can tell. I know 221, 329 isn't the best on base percentage and whatnot, but 441 slugging compared to 352 last year, he's turning more of his fly balls or more of his pulls into fly balls, which is resulting in him. Yes, he pulls it a decent amount, but at least that's turning into power and oftentimes into home runs. So I love that from Hassan Kim. And I think it was on Saturday's game, he almost made like the play of the year, getting a ball that we'll, we'll talk about Saturday's game in one second, but. A ball that bounces off of the third base bag. He goes diving. Or you guys got it. I mean, this is incredible. Even though he didn't make the play. Goes diving to the right. And then the ball bounces up. So he has to make a quick adjustment, adjustment with his hand. Grabs it. Unfortunately, can't quite make the throw. It wasn't the fault of the first baseman or anything. But Hassan Kim, man. Watching that guy play defense is, is a treat. Along with him and uh, Manny, right? Awesome stuff. Uh, so for the Padres, yeah, that's basically it for this game, guys. So let's now talk about something that always makes the play. That always comes through. All right. Let's talk about Built Bars, ladies and gentlemen. The best protein bars in all of the land. Summer is inbound, ladies and gentlemen. And with summer, you're going to need some food on the go. Built Bars are the perfect snack to take with you on family vacations. Throw them in your bags and your kids' backpacks. Make sure that everyone has a bar so you are fueled for your summer adventures. What I love is aside from tasting good, 100% covered in chocolate, soft and easy to chew, they are healthy for you. Check this out. 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. 17 grams of protein. Shout out Philip Rivers, former San Diego Charger. Great. Compare that to a candy bar. Those usually have 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs, guys. So in the health factor, they are killing it. And for moi, one of my favorite things is they are absolutely phenomenal when it comes to a variety of flavors, double chocolate, banana cream pie, raspberry, cherry barcia, and they have new flavors coming in all the time. So you got to do a little bit of a check every now and then. See what nice new flavor they have cooking up over there at Built Bars HQ, guys. And because you're listening to this podcast, guess what? That's not all. You get a discount. Use the promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Remember that is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built. As always, guys, one more time, thank you for making Lockdown Padres your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Let's talk about the one loss of the weekend, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about the offense in general. That is on Saturday's game, in which the Padres got wiped off the face of the earth, eight to nothing. It was unfortunate. And look, this is not the fault of Sean Maniah. Sean Maniah in this game still uh, did a pretty good game. I mean, he did go six innings. He gives up three earned runs on seven hits, walking one and striking out eight. His ERA on the year is about three, not about, it is 3.75, which honestly is kind of what I expect. Maybe you can hope for a 3.5, maybe even a 3.4, but the whiff stuff is great. But sometimes, unlike a Joe Musgrove, he can get hit up. He can get hit up, and the Marlins definitely made him pay uh, throughout this game. A Joe Dunand home run, who was the nephew of Alex Rodriguez, actually, uh, in the top of the third inning. Garrett Cooper double, allowing Jacob Stallings and uh, Dunand to score. So he makes a couple mistakes, but... You know, that's not all. We get a Jazz Chisholm double that scores uh, scores Brian De La Cruz and then a Jorge Soler grand slam to just blow everything off the face of the earth. That stinks. Soler I actually talked about with uh, Peter Pratt that I actually think he's going to be a little bit better. I think Avisel Garcia is an absolute... If I'm a Marlins fan, I'm scared about that one. I think that dude might be bad. He's kind of like their first baseman in the every other year respect. He's never had like two good years in a row, Avisel Garcia. And yes, long-time listener, in the pod, I'll cop to it. I kind of was interested in just because I thought he wouldn't cost much, but five years, 59. No, I thought he was going to be like a two year 20 guy. And I was like, okay, I mean, if the Padres can't get anybody, this might be a decent upside play, but he's looked terrible. So, Lair, I think he's getting a little bit unlucky. I think he's like a 230 hitter with like a mediocre on base of like 330, 320, 
but he can at least give you like 38 home runs or something like that, right? That's why I think it's going to happen for Soler. A flawed player, but not useless. He can do some stuff for you. Anyway, um, that's basically all I'll talk about in this game. I will say, in regards to the Padres' offense, just absolutely falling asleep, Pablo Lopez is pretty good. Uh, he's pretty good. This Marlins rotation, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, Yes, is electric. Padres is a little bit off right now. He's having a sophomore slump. They've also up hopefully soon. But with Lazardo, with Sandy Alcantara, who we did we did manage to hit against, but still Pablo Lopez. I mean, they got a rotation over there in Miami, a special rotation potentially for years to come. Uh, Lopez in this game, no earned runs, gives up five hits, walks two, strikes out five. His ERA on the season is currently one. Yeah, I know. He's got a one ERA, and his whip is at, let me see here, let's say it's 0.99, 0.89 uh, whip for my guy here. Yeah, and then in this game also, and just in terms of the offense, shouldn't say too much here. Nobody struck out more than once, but nonetheless, just another game of missed opportunities, kind of leaving up a couple guys on base, not really coming up clutch and whatnot. Grisham in this game, since he's become apparently my favorite target, 0 for 4 in this one, not making good contact our guy whatsoever, not hitting the ball particularly hard. His, I'm telling you, he's Joey Gallo right now, Right now, I don't know that that's what he is, but he's kind of Joey Gallo without the power, where it's just walks and strikeouts, and that's kind of it with him. 15 walks, 29 Ks uh, before the the account, the, uh, the the results of yesterday's game. Nonetheless, though, still got to have faith that he's going to improve as time goes along. And in general, the Padres' offense, I mean, it's rough, right? But this is kind of the thing that I was expecting. I was expecting that pitching would hopefully carry them a lot until Tatis comes back and until maybe they make a trade for an impact bat. We still have to see how things play along. I mean, the and look, here's the thing is, while the Mackenzie Gore situation is very interesting, it opens up. Too much pitching is never a bad thing. It's not bad to have too much of something because then maybe you can say, if the, if the Padres decide, Right? What if Nick Martinez and Mackenzie Gore, they're like, you know what? These guys are both legit. We think Martinez is going to maintain his 3 3 ERA or maybe up there with Manaya and whatnot. And they're like, maybe we trade away Manaya. Maybe we trade away one of these guys that's going to be potentially, you know, gone after the free agents or after after the season because they're entering free agency. And that's Clevenger, Musgrove, and Manaya. Maybe they do that. Maybe they trade for a good bat. I, I'm just saying that having a lot of pitching is a good thing, man. This is awesome. And it's a really fun position to be in. Uh, the question is whether or not the bats can come back. It is worth noting that both Will Myers and Luke Voigt are currently absent from the lineup. But, you know, I know what you might be thinking. Well, it's not like those guys are all that great anyway. Voigt, uh, it should be mentioned, has, in his past two rehab stints, rehab games over in the minors, has gone 0 for 4 with four strikeouts in two consecutive games. That's right. Eight straight strikeouts. Again, I know that like reading into some of these minor league rehab stints and spring training related stuff, it's similar to that. And the respect that you can't read too much into it, but it's still scary. And when you watch the strikeouts, they're bad. Just go look up some of the tape on the void stuff. It looks like he's, it looks like anything kind of low in a way. He's like forcing it. And then he's trying to nuke something like he's Mike Trout trying to like sledgehammer, right? And trying to dig something out of the ground and yeet it into Jupiter, right? Like he's kind of, it looks like he's forcing so much. At the beginning of the season, it was great seeing all the walks and whatnot, but he wasn't drawing any hits, and he's not making the best contact. So I am worried about Voight, and I'll cop to that one. I really was high on Luke Voight. One thing I, I did say, uh, like two weeks ago before Luke Voight got hurt, I did say, maybe from now on, maybe do we underestimate in baseball, in sports in general, when a certain team makes a trade versus another team? It's easy to hate on the Yankees. It's so much fun, man. I love it. It's great. All right. I recently, in an article for Just Baseball, talked about the top five teams uh, easiest to root for. I mentioned the Mets because you get to root against the Yankees almost in some way. But when you, when, if let's say that the Marlins made this trade with us, let's say the Rockies, let's say the D backs, let's say the Kansas City Royals, some teams that are being run a little bit questionably, you're like, oh, yeah, we probably, you know, got rid of them, but it's easy to hate on the Yankees, but it's still a smart and steady organization right now in the bigger areas. I know everyone has questions about Aaron Boone and the manager and because they're home run happy ball and whatnot, but they don't do giant mistakes like that. It feels like, and they kind of gave them away for nothing. Did the Yankees maybe know something? Did they know? Actually, it's not that we want to sign Anthony Rizzo and that we just don't have a place for Voight. 
it's actually that we're like, no, we actually don't even think he's that good. Let's just get whatever we can for him, right? The Padres are desperate for power. Let's go to them. We'll get Justin Lang, right? So that's kind of the the vibe, right? That's kind of the the feeling of it. I still thought he had something to prove. Hopefully he comes back and looks better, but this is scary. Uh, it's, it's starting to become like, oh man, yeah, the Yankees might have just known what they're doing. That's a pretty smart organization. Not the smartest, but a pretty smart one. So I am worried about that. Not worried about Cronenworth. Not worried about um, the Padres pitching whatsoever. But got this series coming up against the Chicago Cubs, which should be a whole lot of fun. And then the Atlanta Braves. And then the Philadelphia Phillies. So a lot of fun uh, matchups coming up uh, for the next couple of weeks or so. And then San Francisco and then Milwaukee, right? So no more kind of bottom barrel teams or whatnot. The Padres are currently sitting on 19 wins. They look really solid. They're winning with their pitching. Um, this Cub series, it's one to type kind of win. The Cubs are not a fantastic team. Say Suzuki, he's a star, but he's kind of been really bad lately. His K rate has skyrocketed ever since those first electric couple weeks that he had. Um, hopefully they keep winning, but in terms of every other thing, it's basically all I got, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a really successful weekend. I think that the Padres showed that they can win against those big pitching teams. The problem is. If the first baseman, who, by the way, hit a couple fly balls in yesterday's game, I should say, even though they were like just sky high, going nowhere pop-ups, um, even if the ground ball man, even if Manny Machado don't hit, can they still score? That's a big question. And for me, the way I look at it is just to do a too long, didn't listen type of breakdown. I think Kim is becoming an average player when it comes to his at-bats. Hopefully he can continue the steady walk rate and whatnot and make it that more of his pulls are fly balls, because that could relate to fly ball home run luck and just lead to more home runs. He almost had one on Saturday's game, by the way. Almost had one. Was it Saturday? Might have been yesterday's game. I am blinking. But he almost had one. I think it was yesterday's game. Almost had one, and he knows he missed it. It was yesterday's game. He knows he missed it. More stuff like that. I think Cronenworth's going to get better. But Matt Beatty, Trace Thompson, Will Myers when he comes back, by the way, Luke Voigt question marks, and Trent Grisham question marks. I think Cronenworth will be fine. So that's three guys, Cronin, Machado, first baseman. Can they get a fourth guy? Can they get a fifth guy that can just be good, right? I think Kim can be solid, but Profar, he was fun at the beginning. Uh, heading into Thursday's game, he was like one of his last 27. Almost right after my podcast, when I started talking about how much I was buying into, to a degree, Profar becoming that kind of dynamic, solid, uh, end of the lineup sort of hitter, potentially. He's just faltered completely. So hopefully that can change. And by the way, he made a bases error, not blunder. It was a guy, um, bottom nine, pro far on an errant throw, by the way, from the Marlins, which kickstarts this whole thing, of course, after Grisham uh, potentially hits into a double play. Or was it Grisham? I don't think it was Grisham. Who the heck was it? I have it right in front of me. Sorry, guys. Um, but, you know, that errant throw, it was Machado, actually. Yeah, because it was Kim. Okay, there we go. Or it was pro far because it's the top of what am I doing? I am so stupid. What the, who the heck was it that made it uh, on base there? Let me see what happened. Let me see what happened. I got to get this right before we leave. It was Trent Grisham reached on Joey Wendell's throwing error. Pro far to second. Trent Grisham. Okay, it was Grisham. Okay. Um, that pro far tries running to third because nobody was covering it. Gets beat. Thank the Lord for Jorge Alfaro redeeming ourselves because we would have been mad at pro far for the rest of the game. But that's my perspective on it. Will the Padres make a trade later on? I don't know. I don't know what pieces they have exactly. Just got to hope that guys start looking a little bit better. I think the offense can be like middle of the league. That's a really good though, especially because Machado apparently said, I got an idea. Tatis is gone. Fine. I'll just go win the MVP. That's basically what Manny Machado decided. And I, for one, I'm all for it. So hopefully guys, we continue the pace. And with that all being said, that about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast. The only pot. That may be better than the pot Dre's themselves. Going to be doing a chat with Dan tomorrow's episode, everybody. Then going to be recapping some Cubs games as the, the week goes along. Maybe do some more fun crossovers as time goes on with Phillies and Atlanta and all that sort of stuff. That should be a lot of fun. But Dan Good is an author of the Ken Caminetti um, biography uh, book that is coming out May 31st, which you guys should check out. Was going to do the episode last week. Ended up running out of time and schedule stuff. But that's a really fun interview. You guys should look forward to that. And look forward to the rest of this podcast, free and available on all platforms that you want, at LO underscore Padres on Twitter and at Jabapeno, J-A-V, 
I-I-P-E-N-O. And until next time, stay safe and of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies, take care.